It's spring. The common koala are back. Day and night they call. Day and night. Until hopefully they get lucky. The male is black with a red eye. Female brown and spotted with a beautiful tail, like a sequin trail on a grubby bridal gown. Of course, the common coal is a cuckoo. They're parasitic. They lay eggs in other birds' nests and have them reared by unwitting foster parents. It's a hasty wedding that ends with summer, so to speak. And from the Australian Museum, ornithologist Walter Bowles. The big, noisy cuckoos that most people in the Sydney area are acquainted with, the channel bill and the coal, have been back for or three or four weeks now. Mm. And they arrive back, and they're, so they're starting to hoot around and fight for territory. Who does the hooting? Is it, is it the male or the female? It's, I'm thinking of common coals, which is the one most yeah. people know. Woo, 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 woo. Woo, woo. That type of yeah. sound, is that the male? Which the uh, most, There is a female call and there's a male call and they have sort of different different functions. And So one of it's to yell at other co-owls and say, I've staked out this area and all the nests in it are mine, mine. mine. And others may contest that and so they yell back and forth at each other. And then it yells at the female and whether they're actually saying, you know, we're going to go to this nest here and... Something. Do they lay one egg, by the way, or two? It's usually one per nest. So they're the parents of only children, and they don't even stop to actually bring up the only child. But for a long time, it was thought that cuckoos just, that was it. They laid the egg and went away. There's increasingly number of observations of cuckoos actually slipping back in to occasionally feed their young. Really? And even with things like channel bills, when young birds are getting ready to migrate, they leave their hosts, something clicks over in their mind that says, you are now a cuckoo, you were not, you were a currawong, now you're a cuckoo, you're getting ready to migrate. And sometimes they pair to meet up with adult cuckoos in preparation for migration. But some of these observations are really quite recent, so it probably has not been studied in any great detail. Would they work together in a way so that the male actually attracts the attention of its potential hosts while the female lobs into the, the nest and lays its egg? It certainly seems to be that way. Uh, one, the pr flight profile of some of these does look a bit like a, a raptor that might want to nibble on someone anyway. But you often see males getting mobbed, and uh, certainly some of the observations suggest that as the male gets mobbed, lures everyone away, female can then slip into the nest and lay an egg very quickly. Paying attention to birds is paying attention to life itself, says Graham Gibson in his bedside book of birds. If I can amass 600 bird sightings, that's a lot of life in return for simply paying attention. Presently, I've ticked 13 birds. Well, 14, if you count the common coal. Silver gull! <coughs> Rainbow lorikeet! <coughs> Noisy miner! Wandering albatross! <coughs> Will you shut up? It's six o'clock in the bloody morning! And obviously, everyone's not interested in bird watching. Keith Brownwood from the Cumberland County Bird Observers Club has asked me if I want to go bird watching. I do, and I don't. I do because I need the oxygen, but I don't because it disrupts my pattern. I love familiarity. That's why I like talking about myself. It's nice of Keith to ask that. As Freud says, happiness is working for the goodness of everyone. Like when an egg thrown from a moving vehicle hit my neighbor in the face and he started hemorrhaging from the eye. Everyone was in shock, except one guy who soothed the chap by throwing him a tennis ball and encouraging him to catch it and saying well done when he did. He felt happy because he was helping someone else. On this bird watching trip, Keith promises me a rock warbler. Any birder worth his salt who comes into New South Wales and doesn't go away seeing the rock warbler has got to feel pretty depressed, I would reckon. I'm going for an audition for a breakfast cereal ad. I'm supposed to play a grain of wheat. Hmm. I have to train at 11 a.m. I loathe training. I'd rather pull a muscle than stretch. Suppose I could train later, but I need to grill some chicken thigh fillets before their expiry date. I wonder if birds can taste. Yes. Tell me more. Birds can certainly taste, and they do learn what they like and what they don't like. Um, there's certainly were some tests in North America giving birds, wanderers, wander butterflies, which they call monarchs there, which have a bad taste. And you could 
you could see the birds would take, a bot, take one of these and spit it out and feel pretty grossed out by it. I don't really want to go for this grain of wheat ad. I don't want to face the rejection. Middle-aged men are made up of 90% praise. Without praise, we turn bitter. But I do need the bucks. I feel like the pied currawong on my neighbour's antenna being harassed by noisy miners. Why do birds mob? It's a protection. There are things out there which they perceive to be predators, or at least potential predators, um, either of young or nests, or even you know adult birds. So if you mob it, you let it know that you know it's there. So there's not going to be any stealth. It's not going to sneak up on you. And you may be able to discomfort enough that it will want to move. How do I fit bird watching into my life? It's so boring creating obstacles just to avoid stuff all the time. Every time I touch something, it's one more thing I have to deal with. Why do woolly wagtails always move their tails? Good question. Oh, thank you. It's been suggested that at least the wing flicks, which they also do, and probably the, the tail wag helps flush small insects. So you see them, they tend to do little runs and stop and flick their wings and wag their tail and hopefully they're flushing small insects which they can chase down. How are you going, Mum? I'm fine. And how's yourself? I'm very good. Are you? Would you like to come to dinner with uh, the family? Yeah, yeah. What night? Well, which uh, would suit you? I don't know. What what day's better for you? What you got bowls on Tuesday? Oh well, I bowl on Tuesday. But I can't go to dinner. I've got to cook these chicken thigh fillets. They're almost past the expiry. And do some casserole. And then I'm having a bath and watching TV until I fall asleep. Is there no more painful journey than the journey from lounge to bed? I need to wash the sheets too. Wash sheets or sleep alone? How long can you leave sheets before washing them? Two weeks? Three weeks? I sleep better alone anyway. Does that make me cold saying that? I always sleep in the defensive position, on my side, arms folded, so no one can take my sleep away. I love sleep. Must have sleep. I'll leave the sheets another week. Do birds have a scent? Many birds have a scent. Some you don't notice unless you work around them quite a bit, but some are very strong. The seabirds have very strong odors, uh, which never go away. And as I found last week when I was helping move them in the collection, and I wandered down to join some friends at the pub, they all looked at me and said, ooh, you've been working with seabirds. What do they smell like? It's a musty, not particularly fishy smell, but a very strong smell that just stays forever and it permeates your clothes and hair. Ibis have a very strong smell, flamingos, rosellas have a sort of very sweet smell. When you lie on a sheet, make a mark where the perimeter of your body is. After a reasonable time, make a mark where your body warmth has spread out to, then measure the gap between the two marks for an accurate indicator of human warmth. I just made that up. On one hand, I'm like a double barred finch. The double barred is a gregarious social bird. They like a drink every hour, and if there is abundant water, they bathe a lot. Yeah, finches are all terrific bathers. Get in there, get saturated. All of them. Because not all birds like to be saturated, do they? No. Honey eaters just, if you notice, honey eater just drops on the water and flies to the tree. Drops on the water, flies to the tree. Whereas the finches, they stand in the water and fluff up the feathers and the wings and get saturated. Yeah. It's a bit like my son who spends 15 minutes in the shower. Yeah, he's a finch. <laughs> <laughs> Us pommies are probably honey eaters, in and out. <laughs> Does anybody else think it's weird that Keith's in the shower with me? Double bar finch is the one which looks like a tiny owl. A lot of the Americans come over here and say, oh, look at that little owl. In other words, happiness is obtained by following the pleasure principle, sudden satisfaction and pent up needs. But I also crave solitude, detachment, like the white-throated tree creeper. Even mating pairs of white-throated tree creepers spend very little time together. Detachment, as Freud says, keeps unpleasurable experiences at arm's length, creates the illusion of peace and quiet. The other bird I'd like to ask you about is the white-throated tree creeper, because I'd been led to believe, I mean, I haven't seen a white-throated tree creeper, but I've been led to believe they're very solitary birds, but you beg to differ. Yeah, no, I don't think they're solitary birds. I mean, they're a common bird. You see them nearly in every forest and you hear them. They're a very vocal bird. 
and you can get two on a tree, on the same tree, male and female. I suppose once you start living a single life, of course, you know, then that leads to trouble, doesn't it, when you're supposed to be with somebody else? No comment. <laughs> you know more about that than me, I think. I do know more about that than you, exactly. I think Richard Noski's work on them some years ago found that they they tend to be a bit belligerent and, you know, I think pairing up tends to be a reluctant behaviour at the best of the time. But you can get into a territory where you will have the adults there and some young ones and they're certainly not feeding right next to each other, but they stay in the same vicinity for a while, yeah. Now back to you, Keith. The white-throated tree creeper, now they've got a peculiar bathing habit. Yes, watching them come on a on your bathing bath at home, your bird bath, they always come in in reverse, they back down into the water where all other birds either fly in and fly out or walk in. These reverse down the slope, if it is a sloping uh, bath, which most bird baths are, and they reverse down into the water. It's like they're wearing flippers when you have to go into the surf, you've got to back in. Exactly, yeah, and that could, could be it because they have very long toes for clinging onto the trees, so maybe that's the reason, Steve. You could be a researcher here in birds. <laughs> you see, that's why when you bring somebody into the bird watching world a bit like me, who's certainly got a maverick way of looking at things, maybe I can open doors for you, people yeah, like yourself. Exactly, yeah, I agree. Yes, mavericks can be solitary, but stand still too long and you get covered in cobwebs. And when you're covered in cobwebs, you look spooky and no one wants to touch you. Sorry. Why are there two sides to everything? You stand where you thought it was greener, then you want to be back where you were. I bought some new jeans to spruce myself up a little for meetings and auditions, but they need taking up because they drag along the ground like mud flaps on an old Cortina. Folded cuffs make a squat man look shorter and plumper and even more dishevelled. I instantly look like an ibis. Again, albeit wearing new jeans. I've heard a rumour that uh, ibises have worked out a way to flip cane toads and eat them. Have you heard this? I'm not sure about ibis, whether they actually have the equipment to get into a cane toad once they flipped him. If it was a small one, they might, but you wouldn't, they still wouldn't want to eat it whole because of the, the poison glands. Because that means crows and ibises could be at the forefront of repelling the cane toad from moving further south. They could be quite important in that regard because it's, it's something that once it's worked out by some birds, if it can be learnt by others. Remember those jeans with the folded cuffs? Well, dropping them off to be taken up is admitting that I'm no good with my hands. I was never allowed to use utensils growing up in case I managed to create something without parental help. A confident only child is much harder to smother. My mother used to cut my steak into cubes for me at restaurants. That was particularly embarrassing at my 40th birthday. What was the bird that really got your juices flowing, your, your epiphany bird? I remember seeing my first bald eagle. You know, that one came around and there it was sitting in a tree. But one that really struck me, and it was less from the appearance than from the call. And the bird books we had then, the field guides, would have these transliterations of the calls of different birds. And some of these were very intriguing. Some just, you know, said a, a breezy whistle or something like that. Which, but occasionally they'd put it in words. And I remember the warbling vireo, it said, if I could see one, I would seize one, I would squeeze one till it squirts, which was quite a good one. But the yellow warbler was one that said, sweet, 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 I am so sweet. And so, you know, I was with a friend who was also starting in the field. And we were out looking, and one day, we, a yellow warbler said it and it enunciated it exactly as it in the book. And you get you know, enough variety and you get the cadence and everything, but this one actually said, sweet, 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 I am so sweet. And we just looked at each other and we both repeated it then and there. Oh, it's been a very bad week for ticking you birds. Very bad, very bad. I guess 14, well, that's the common koa. I was so tempted to go over to the park last night and say to this common koa, Hey, look, buddy, I'll go out with you if you can just shut up for a while. 15, that's the willy wagtail. That's wagtail for piss off. Oh, and I suppose 16 is the double barred finch. 17, white throated tree creeper. 18, that'd have to be your Australian white ibis. 19, well, I'm claiming Keith's rock warbler. Rock warbler, isn't that a B 52 song? Only 581 birds to go before I have 600 on my definitive list of other people's bird sightings. Mm. 
I just got to the chicken thigh fillets in time. Season with salt, pepper, Greek oregano, then grill and serve with a liberal squeeze of lemon. Mm. Five years of studying jazz guitar just to do that riff. Sitting on a towel with you in a paddock, a hawk up above. Why don't we sort of hawk? Maybe more likely to be a kestrel, try kestrel. Sitting on a towel with you in a paddock, a kestrel up above. Kestrel doesn't really work. Maybe try a kite. Yeah, all right. What sort of kite? What about um, a black-shouldered kite? Yeah, black-shouldered kite. Yeah, I think that can be my 20th bird, black-shouldered kite. Wait a minute, I'll just look up Simpson and uh, see what they say about the uh, black shoulder kite. Body white with grey and white wings, prominent black shoulders. Male slightly smaller. Hunts hovering over tall grasses. Well, that's perfect. Black shoulder kite. Here we go. Five years jazz guitar. Beautiful. Sitting on a towel with you in a paddock, a kite up above. It seems so romantic, I let my hand brush your arm. The lust in my body gives me quite a charm. This is the moment I want to say I love you. I feel that you feel the same. Oh, let's tell the truth. There's nothing in our way except this kite buzzing round about a mile away. Then I close my eyes and kiss you, kiss you. You move a bit and I miss you, miss you. Then you say you'd rather have a man who is better with his hands, hands, hands. Better with his to be continued.